recording without even testing to see if it's recording. You're just going to trust it? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a trust. I'm trusting it. Awesome. Yeah. I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> You've always been a, living on the edge. Uh, living on the edge. Uh huh. Yep. Me and Steven Tyler. Is that that elf's mom? I mean, dad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, the elf's dad. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, Ryan, elf's brother McKenna. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm Harlan Gypsy Jazz Grant. <laughs> And this is um, Daughter's oh, Philosophy oh. Podcast. Network. Stuff. <laughs> you said it last time. I thought it was. We're not a thing. I don't know if I we'll know. ever be a thing, but we're not we're a not. thing yet. <laughs> yeah. Thing one and thing two. I like how some people are like really pissed off that we do this at the beginning. And they're like, I tried to listen to that podcast, and it was just two idiots. They were just laughing at each other's stupid jokes. <laughs> and it was... Yeah, I do listen. I listen to others sometimes. And when I do listen to some, I think a lot of podcasts out there are are pretty fucking serious, you know? And it's very just straight. And, uh, you know, I'm so-and-so, and I'm so-and-so. And this so is the button-down so podcast. Blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, and then they're, then always it's an interview, and, you know, and then they just, all they have to do is just ask the questions and then edit the thing after. Lazy bastards. I'm not saying that's bad. <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad to interview people, I'm not, but it's it it's done st- sort of straight you know it's it's not done the the joe rogan style that's for damn sure it's much more just you know tell us about what you've researched you know um and i guess some people just really like getting down to brass tacks but uh speaking of brass tacks what the hell are we talking about today yeah we're gonna get all nerdy talk about some ideas and highfalutin philosophy we're gonna talk about one of my favorites Another one of these underappreciated philosophers slash polymathic little do a little bit of everything, whose name is Anatole Rappaport, um, the, who I got to know through general semantics, because he is, in my opinion, one of the best. Like, if Korzybski is too long-winded and kind of ridiculous, like, oh, I, I know everything, and let me tell you, and I'm a count... And then, you know, Robert Anton Wilson is a little bit out there and, you know, he's not straight enough. I think Rappaport is really good for being in between those two. And he puts forth things very clearly and, you know, not stodgy, but it's academic and straight and whatever. Uh, His first book, and I think that it's titled this way on purpose to evoke Korzybski's Science and Sanity. Rappaport's first book was Science and the Goals of Man, and that's where he talks quite a bit explicitly about general semantics, though it is clearly heavily influential in all the rest of his work that I've read. Rappaport is a 20th century dude. He was born in Ukraine in 1911, moved to the U.S. as a youngish kid. 
like 10 year old or whatever. He at first studied music and he became a pianist and a composer. And then he went into the military and became a pilot, flew in World War II, and then came out of the war and was like, I fucking hate everything about war. And I refuse to ever participate in this again. Uh And when Vietnam happened, he was vocally anti war and he you know but he was losing that battle and ended up moving to canada to get the fuck away from the united states's militarism so he taught uh well i mean he studied math and psychology and got one or two doctorates in those and he taught at michigan and they taught at toronto when he abandoned the united states for being warmongers and then he co-founded the society for general systems research with the guy who's usually called the grandfather or father of systems theory, that Ludwig von Bertalanffy or whatever, however you pronounce his name. But Rappaport was mm. heavily involved Butterfly. in that. Where I had first run into his name and where most people of my generation, I think, did was that he was the, the tit-for-tat guy who won that Prisoner's Dilemma, the first tournament where they wrote programs to play multiple iterated prisoner's dilemma games and then measure who accumulated the most points and whatnot. So he was he wrote a lot about game theory. The book that we're going to talk about today, the one before Fights, Games, and Debates, which talks about those three terms among other things, this one is called Conflict in Man-Made Environment from 1974. Awesome. Since, since the last couple of weeks... We talked about, like, it, it reminded me to go back and reread this one, but when we were talking about Zizek and Peterson debating about Marx, and then last time we were talking about these socio-political revolutions and stuff. So we were much more, you know, almost current events and social. And then mm-hmm. I always want to bring things back to the conceptual foundation. So I was like, this reminds me of that Rappaport book. We're going to try to go under and behind the stuff we were talking about in the last couple of weeks and look at one example of a sort of conceptual framework for as general as we can think and talk about the institution of conflict. Does that make sense? Let's do it. And as a little cherry on top, at some point in here, we're going to talk about how I think that Rappaport totally scooped Dawkins on the meme concept, though he just didn't give it a catchy name. But Selfish Gene was 1976, right? So I think this is a little bit of a Darwin Wallace thing where probably Dawkins hadn't read this. Rappaport wrote a chapter about these cultural replicators and imitation as a mechanism for cultural evolution and stuff that really sounds like memes, but a couple of years earlier. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 74. And then you got, (laughs) that's why you're Oh man. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, I gotta say something. Well, just as a reminder for folks, he wrote it before the other guy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hey, Two years apart, people. So in this book, kind of the second half is talking about more like what we talked about before. He writes writes chapters about Hobbes and Hegel and Marx and Lenin and all these guys who deal with the contemporary socio-political stuff. But I tend to gravitate more toward the first half of the book where he's just laying out all of the underlying conceptual framework stuff that's what i like and so that's what we're gonna talk about i'll probably be reading a fair number of quotes this week it's been a while since i did that so i'm jonesing (laughs) so we're pretty much actually gonna because i again really appreciate the way rapaport writes and how he lays things out so i'll read a bunch of quotes and we'll kind of just go straight up in order that of the way he develops it in the first hundred pages of conflict and man-made environment So he starts out at the very beginning like this. Quote, Like all other organisms, man receives inputs from his environment and secretes outputs into it. Some of the inputs are life-sustaining and others are noxious, even lethal. 
The outputs modify the environment, some make it more livable and some less so. But unlike any other biological type, man modifies his environment cumulatively, so that now his environment is mostly of his own making. This includes not only technical artifacts, but also the symbolic environment. The man-made environment, including the symbolic, will then appear like man himself as a product of evolution of systems. So that's what I think the subtitle or the part of the title, the man-made environment and conflict in the man. It, well, he doesn't say the. I, think, I don't know if he gets that from Bucky Fuller or the other way around, but they like to talk without saying the. They just conflict in man-made environment. <laughs> and I think that's part of the whole non-identity thing. Like we don't want to be exclusive and say there's one article that includes that makes up the man-made environment, but it's uh -huh. all the symbolic aspects of our life. And he has a bunch of kind of Hofstadterian chapters of writing little story passages or using a bunch of examples, such as uh, the, he'll go through the day in the life of Mr. A. And Mr. A will be awakened by an alarm clock and already like, and then he talks about how that's a symbol. Well, in the in one sense, it's just there's a loud noise in my room at what appears to be a random time. These clocks are symbols, and the hands point to this thing, and we have time, and that's a human symbolic invention. We run our lives around instead of whether you're tired or vibrant or whether the sun is up or down. No, we ab abstract it, pull it out, make it a symbol, and live by that. And then he goes into the kitchen and selects a box of some edible based on what the words written on the outside or the pictures that he got from a supermarket that where the food was delivered and that was all mediated through a bunch of symbols and someone exchanged money to get it and money's a symbol. And he just goes into how... Notice how removed from the quote-unquote physical world human beings have become. And how little we have to worry about tooth and claw and sustenance and shelter. At least those of us in America 2019. Most people are living at a distant remove from the animal. And we live in this symbolic man-made environment of technology and symbols. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I noticed that. <laughs> The nature of the symbolic environment is such that it depends in great measure on what men think or say about it. Writes Rappaport. Unlike the physical world, if a bear comes and eats your face, there's it doesn't matter what you think about it or if you say, Stop! Stop! Don't! The bear still eats your face. The symbols are pointless. If you're dying of thirst in the desert... Saying water, water doesn't help, or whatever. Looking at your clock, looking at your compass doesn't help. You're out in the middle of nowhere. Your symbols are useless. You die. But that we, very few humans anymore, are subject to those sorts of problems. Our problems are all symbolic now. Well, I got fired from my job. That's all symbolic. Or I'm in debt. That's all symbolic, etc. Our problems and conflicts are mostly now those of the man-made environment. You agree? Yeah. Mostly, yes. I mean, we are <laughs> like still mostly, subject to yeah. the other one at the same... And it could rear its ugly head at any moment. But it is kept at bay by these cultural artifices that we mostly reside within and amongst. Yeah, I would say... I don't know. I, I, I almost kind of want to feel like you have to frame it. What I'm about to say, like in 1980, where I live versus where you live, I think I would be even more embedded in a symbolic world, perhaps even than you, because you're really out there. Like the, you could walk 50 paces and just be out where symbols might not help you. Right. You know what I mean? Whereas I could walk 50 paces and it would just be the same shit and I could use the symbols and I'd be more intensely interacting. However, today you have in your pocket probably some kind of device that continues to allow you to access that world of symbols rather than 
maybe uh, 40 years ago or whatever, when we didn't have access to the symbolic, or we didn't spread its domain as far as we have at this point. Yeah, anyway. totally. So it sounds like it's definitely growing and it's crowding out even our opportunities to be away from it all. And we even kind of freak out to an extent when we don't, we're like, I don't have any bars or whatever. Or what, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you're hungry, it, you're starving for symbols. The kid in the back seat is all fucking bored and you're like, I'm taking your phone, we're on a family vacation. Be here with us and experience it. And they're like, this is boring, I don't have enough symbols. Yeah, and then uh, I remember there was a, I, I, I often bring up this, this person from time to time, but I, there was a Anthony Bourdain was saying that even in like the Congo, though, like just in the middle of the jungle, they would they could look at their phones and just have like full bars mm-hmm. like on their phones. <laughs> it's just like wow, that's intense. Um, I know that's not always the case, depending on I don't know if you're in a building, but then you're in a man man made environment. So you might still be compensated for other symbols. But sometimes, you know, if you go to a... I, I remember, you know, I was in at work or at some, you know, when I was at university or whatever. Sometimes I would be like, damn it, my phone's not working in this part of the building for some reason. And every time I'm around here, like the phone just doesn't ring or if someone's trying to call me. Anyway, yeah, that is interesting. Um, and it's... I, yeah, okay. So I'll just you may want to know going, what a symbol is. I don't want to do... Just say, well, we'll get there. So that was the preface, you know, <laughs> a little foreshadowing of where it's going. And we'll now work our way up yeah. to the symbol from, quote-unquote, more basic concepts. Quote, To speak of conflict in any context, we must first identify the conflicting parties. These are not all of the same type. Individual organisms, human and non-human, enter into conflicts with each other. So do aggregates of organisms. We think of aggregates not as mere collections of individuals, but as entities in their own right, sometimes even endowing them with human psychological traits, such as ambitions, beliefs, etc. Conflicting parties appear as units only when they are differentiated from other parties to the conflict. Internally, a conflicting party is a complex, organized aggregate of constituent parts. The constituent parts are not in conflict, at least not the same sort. On the contrary, success in conflict waged by the entity depends on how well its parts are integrated, i.e. cooperate, with each other. Therefore, every instance of external conflict implies internal cooperation. Does that bring up anything that you you just want to say i like it or do you have i mean it just makes me think about kind of some of the ideas that i've had and some of the things that i've been thinking about lately yeah i I don't know if i I, sometimes i'm like should i go there Uh, you know anyway i'm gonna do it but you know my whole idea with episodic synchrony is like the nearest neighbor effects it's you know if you have a you know if a population is growing in at a large, you know, fast or great enough rate, growth rate of the population is increasing the population size. It gets to a point possibly where you don't have, you're not going to have the opportunity to interact with every individual. You can almost say just as a way to kind of get into this scenario, you could be like, oh, okay, if you live in a small town versus if you live in a city, you know, and so you're going to have more or less sort of like nearest neighbor effects and things that you are familiar with. And also, you know, and I'm thinking about like vertical and horizontal heritabilities and things like that. So in evolution, you know, uh, the idea of like, say, kin selection, where, uh, you know, the the benefit, you know, of a particular kind of trait or whatever, will be to an extent rely on, you know, uh, possibly how related you are to the other individuals, depending on how much you're going to cooperate. And so I was always thinking about the the modes, you know, the, you're thinking about diversification and diversity as modality and that the modes, how they cluster up is that they end up having more in common with each other and they're more willing to cooperate and interact and integrate with each other. And then there's the conflict between the modes, you know, between the groups or whatever. I was just thinking about that stuff when you were talk when I was hearing you mm-hmm. say that. That quote. sounds totally related to me. What one aspect of the Rappaport message that I would want to stress when talking that way is the 
user or interpreter sensitivity of the units. Do we want to concentrate on just this individual ape, Coco? Or do we want to concentrate on some population on this island? Or do we want to concentrate on a species? So you can have whatever unit level you want to count as your aggregate or as your party to a conflict. And then you can look at interprimate conflicts or interspecial conflicts, etc. But that you can select out whatever system you want. And that in part, using this lens of conflict is what can help us pick out, it can help us ontologize. That's why this unit is gets a word from us, for example, or gets a spot in the taxonomic table. It's there because that system is used by us in some of our attempting to system systematize or reason about our quote unquote environment. Right. And just to continue on with the my thoughts, I mean there was just today I was reading something about how people were able to I think it was in in Poland, they reconstructed there's about a, a a burial ground that archaeologists and geneticists were able to kind of put together um this group of people who had been uh murdered all with like blows to the head and they have at this point an understanding of the different kinds of groups and this is about like five to six thousand years ago or something like that and then they did the genetic testing and all the people in this pile who were kind of laid there somewhat relatively nicely and laid kind of well they were laid with their family members like so they were put together and the idea was that there was some other group that it seems like they have other data to suggest that the other group was expanding and they just came upon this other group uh, and, you know, totally murdered them and then threw them in a mass grave or whatever. Um, but it's just interesting to think of like, okay, you've got family and it's possible that relatedness was also happening in the group that was the, the offender, you know, and the, you know, the ones that were being attacked, the victims all families, you know, like, and it's sort of the cooperators and then their intergroup conflict together. Anyway, hmm. continue. <laughs> the common feature of all conflicts is the tendency of the conflicting units to maintain their identity as systems. Just to close out that part. I think that makes sense, right? Correct. What the hell is a system? Well, it's that which is not the environment. I think that Rappaport is looking at those two words as a kind of mutually exclusive and exhaustive set of reality, of everything. You're either part of the system or that system's environment. That's it, right? That covers everything. The notion of, quote, environment suggests a partition of a portion of the world into two regions, an inside and an outside. The environment constitutes the outside, the inside will be called a system. In the mind of someone who defines an environment, it is usually the system that is the object of interest. The environment is of interest to the extent that it has a bearing on what goes on in the system. This is the kind of level that I really like to think and talk on. Just these, I think that picture, that account, that strategy can apply to virtually anything. We could be talking about the world, some computer program, some whatever. He talks about, for example, as a mathematician, he talks about sets a lot. And he says, well, a set is anything where you can take an object of inquiry and decide with confidence whether or not it's a member. So that you could, if you wanted to, have a set that is all kangaroos and all typewriters. And then you could call the system the aggregate behavior of all kangaroos and typewriters on Earth in some time period, and the environment is everything else, and then see if you could find anything interesting about that. We tend not to do that because no human yet has noticed anything interesting that can be said about the set all kangaroos and typewriters. So we don't call that a system, but we could if we wanted to because it's just a totally arbitrary move of any theorist 
You can make whatever set you want, call it a system, and look at the way it interacts with its environment. Right. <clears throat> That's, the, I mean, I would, I would agree you could do that. Yeah, but I, I, I'm getting, the drift I'm getting is that he's saying, he's just kind of pushing it out and then he's going to come back and be like, but we would never do that because that's silly. It wouldn't be very productive. Is that what he's trying to say at the end that we have yet to see anything interesting about all the kangaroos and all the typewriters or whatever? Like, sure. You can do that because this tool allows for that. But I'm trying to think of an example of like something you would do. It's kind of like when my son's playing a video game and he goes up to just an innocent person and like, does something like tries to hit him with a hammer or whatever. It's like, but the game, it doesn't do anything. The person just stands there and they, you know, you're supposed to just hit a and talk to them or whatever, <laughs> or get that information that they represent in the game or whatever. So you can do that, but what it does for you or whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, it, the, the, you're supposed to go and do something else. I like that example. Right? Attempting to examine the set kangaroos and typewriters is like attempting to behave some way in a video game that has no programmatic response so that the, it's just the right the, yeah. what we call the world in that instance just doesn't give you anything back it's like all right that's that behavior leads to nothing it's still a system of your character that you're playing jumping and hitting the character that you could interact with in a certain way but doing it in a way that it doesn't respond so that still could be a system of interaction of some kind just there's no kickback yeah you know but i think this is that he's kind of stressing the other side of it than you're stressing yours you want to remind us yeah but a bunch of these are pointless and i think he agrees with you but he's stressing this part you know characteristically Living systems occupy the same gross region as their environment. Each individual is separated by a boundary from its environment, yet the whole collection, say a population consisting of a single species, is, as it were, quote-unquote, dissolved in its environment, somewhat as a solute is dissolved in a solvent. So you take these populations that you really like to talk about, that's kind of like whatever, sugar in water or something, you know, that hasn't... What is left? Okay, we fix our attention on the system. What is left over is the environment. It is important to note, though, that what is a system and what is environment is a matter of subjective preference, depending on what interests us most. So I think he's really stressing the the subjective aspect of it. That it's the observer who selects what we're going to look at as a system, and then treat the rest as environment, and then study the input output across the boundary or whatever of this interaction. Yes. A system and its environment interact. What happens in or to the system depends on what happens in or to the environment. The interaction may be such that the system maintains itself, or it may be such that the system ceases to be. These phrases, maintains itself and ceases to be, are vague. Whether one or the other can be asserted depends on what we mean by itself. And the situation is by no means clear. This is kind of the holism part, I think, right? Like, it's all just one big mass in one sense, or if you look at it that way. <laughs> right. yeah. And it's only when we uh -huh. want to examine it with, through a particular lens that we make this move of abstracting out chunks, calling them systems, and looking at the way they stand in conflict with other systems. Uh-huh. The antelope seems to want to remain an antelope and not become part of the lion and behaves accordingly, attempting to escape. We feel that the antelope and lion are in quote-unquote conflict. So he's, I think, trying to say, like, it's not, there's no fact of the matter or reality about that. That's just the way that we right now find it useful to describe the situation. This thing is a system of a, a very complicated system of cooperating parts all these organs and muscles and bones and all this stuff it's working together we call it a system label it antelope and then we look at the antelope's environment it includes this other system that we call lion which is made of a bunch of complicated cooperating parts and they have this conflict of predatory prey relationship and blah blah, blah and that's what we do interspecies murder <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, I like that just, you know, stepping super far back and looking at things from that, through that lens. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, I, it's funny how these things go. I was thinking about, <clears throat> and I talked about it already, but just like, you know, in, in evolution, there's, you know, like I said, I've already mentioned kin selection, but then there's multi-level selection theory, or, or sometimes in the, old, in the old days, it was called group selection. And I won't get into the details of it, but it's just funny that, you know, I was thinking about mm. that today. Uh, and, and, you know, the kin selection thing would be like, all right, whoever you're related to, you know, those are those individuals that you're going to cooperate with or, or try and finagle yourself to assist. You won't do that with those other ones that you're not related to. The, I, I wouldn't say it this way, you know, is the way it is, but in a way it's almost like those who cooperate better with each other could outcompete the other groups that don't, you know, cooperate with each other very well. And I think that's the whole multi-level yeah, thing. Yeah, and I think uh, anyway. Rappaport is on board with you. Continue. Because the next highlighted section I had deals with, as far as I understand, exactly that. Whether one sees cooperation or competition oh. <laughs> depends on what one is singled out a system and what is environment. Natural selection operates on systems, and these may comprise single organisms or populations of organisms or complex populations of different organisms called ecosystems. In principle, the boundaries of a system separating it from environment are a matter of observer choice. So that's kind of, I guess that would be repetitive on that, but I think it's important. I like that Rappaport says it. Apparently, you are also cool with it. I think a lot of people wouldn't be, right? They would want to argue, no, some things really are systems and some aren't, and we can d develop a account of how to distinguish r real systems from not or whatever but right i think so i mean i would just say for instance the right now on twitter between some idw types and then philosophers of math and stuff are talking about like is math constructed or discovered right and so somebody who would want, want to say that it's a discovered you know like the largest prime numbers by Euclid or whatever, you know, that that is, that would be a system that's out there, not something that is contrived by a mathematician using skill and uh, an intimate understanding of the question or the systems, if we're going to use Rappaport, uh, you know, the, the language of Rappaport right now. Not that I'm against using the word system, it's a very general word, but still, I, yeah, I think there are definitely people out there who would say, uh huh. There are real systems out there, and there, you, you goddamn cucks, take your socially con concocted, ah, concocted, nice shit out of my. <laughs> did that come from one face. of them, or did you coin that? It does sound like something they should say. What? You and your social concoctions. Concocted. <laughs> I just, it just, it just came out of me. Yay. Yeah, concoctions. So, yeah, cooperation and conflict both happening all the time. They depend on each other and their observer relative. If you want to talk about antelope and lion, then those things are in conflict and the internal organs of the antelope are cooperating. But then if you just, like, zoom in on the antelope's internal stuff, maybe you could say, oh, well, the digestive system and the reproductive system sometimes compete for uh whatever blood flow or something and like oh my stomach really wants yeah. some help to do better digesting and the erection is like no i want it down here to make you know <laughs> so then they're competing for some resource that's inside the antelope etc but so that you can zoom in and out and you can look at any anything as a system and then tell which parts of its environment it's cooperating with competing with whatever you could also say that uh, an individual, at least in the biological sense, is itself like an ecosystem, at least multicellular organisms. So you can even kind of like, you know, go from the big, like multiple things interacting down to an individual, what we would want to call an individual antelope. But then if you get into the gut and if you get into different parts of its body, it's got all these other things happening that are other organisms. Not just its own single cells, you know, so it's... Yeah, the ecosystem of the microbiome. Of just the organism, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, 
the whole thing. Like it, you couldn't remove right the the bacteria and stuff from the antelope and just be like, okay, on on you go. You know, like it would die. You know, it would need in order to digest the grass and all that. Plus, yeah, anything you've eaten. Anyway, yes. Continue. So in order to have conflict, you need to have cooperation uh, inside the system to have a, to subserve the conflict that's between the systems. Yes, I. This is that to me almost seems like, but I know it's not not. But it almost hits on that like duh, you know, kind of thing. But it's also something that you don't think about all the time, right? It's good to have it pointed out. Right. Exactly. So what we he next is going to move into what some heuristics for usefulness are going to be. Well, now, OK, first you stressed how a system can be any chunk of universe that you want to pick. And, that, and so now we're feeling hopeless and like, oh, my God. So he's like, well, here's how we tend to go about distinguishing systems that we can say useful things about. One unambiguous criterion of identity of a system is steady state. If we are looking at the, you know, like whatever, the paradigm case, though it is an illusion or what is a, you know, a rock or something. Well, that's just in a steady state. It never changes. It sits right there. It's doing the same thing it's doing now as when I was two. And that's, it's just in a steady state. That is, he thinks, too strict. You know, we're interested in more than just steady states. A system is some portion of the world singled out for attention as an object of interest. Yeah, any, any portion of the world could be called a system, yeah. Uh, a collection is a set if we can decide unambiguously whether a given things belong or not. I kind of said that already. Every definition of a system must involve a set, but every not every set deserves to be called a system. Okay, yeah, right, we did that already, kind of. Portions of the world attract our attention if they comprise such a set of interdependent parts. The interdependence is manifested in interaction. It's a sp spatial contiguity is one thing that we really like. It allows us to perceive objects to be named. All human languages contain names of objects. Spatial contiguity and relative invariance of size and shape. Okay, it was kind of building up from there. But that's too boring. So that's the whole part of it. That's all steady state stuff. So then we go from there to equilibrium systems that have some sort of homeostasis. That w So the rock, when it's perturbed, when it's hit by a hammer or something, falls apart and then it's in a bunch of different steady states. But then there's a layer of complexity that you can add where if you poke the thing, it restores back to the shape it was in before. Or what? Right? That's just something that brings it back. Well, you hit this thing with the hammer, uh -huh. and it squishes, but then it comes back and it reforms into the little shape, the ball shape it was in previously. Whatever. Then you've got objects like that that have some level of what appears to us to be internally motivated system change, like the whatever the things that move along gradients you can tell if you put this thing in a liquid where there's saltier thing over here and fresher water over here that it tends to drift in one direction or move itself in one direction because it prefers or whatever mm -hmm. you know, and that's this idea of using human psychological terms and applying them but so that then it's there's some sort of striving that we can attribute or agency mm -hmm. and then you move from those to this idea about the non-equilibrium states and i think you know that's the whole like prigozhin stuff and the whole edge of chaos talk where life is the uh -huh. knife's edge maintaining itself between this static order which is clearly not living but random chaos is also not we don't want to call those things living systems. But there's a Goldilocks right. zone somewhere between those two where the systems drive, or we call it that, to maintain non-equilibrium gradients internally and with their location in environments. And then we call those kind of things the maintenance of 
non-equilibrium states, the you know systems or even living systems that have some kind of structure. I like um, Rappaport's definition of structure as being some sort of internally maintained non-uniformity within a system. And that's what he is saying makes sy the, those systems which have that property are interesting objects of study. Obviously, then, you know, like a white noise is yeah. quite uniform, you know. Not that would be the chaotic, right? Yeah. This is, yeah, exactly. But this is totally like asking for it from like a star trek next generation episode where like the 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 organisms are like even though you think that we are just living in chaos <laughs> this is really something special and we are alive in here or <laughs> yeah I, I mean that would be interesting if you could pull that off but already by the time they're making those sort of utterances understandable by humans it's not at least that is a non-chaotic activity well, they had to yeah. find a way to yeah. communicate to Picard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I always have to like drop a Star Trek reference or a Peter Turchin or an Anthony Bourdain. I got to get some new references. Nah, that's too much work. Anyway, that's too much work. So those aggregates which have that property of, of maintaining non-equilibrium gradients, both internally and then the way they relate to their environment, are typically what human beings single out as being objects of worthy of worthy objects of study and they, those are the systems we care about and so we do it that way and then the way this relates back to the conflict thing is that Rappaport is saying a common feature of all conflicts is this tendency of the systems to maintain their identity and that's you know the homeostatic mechanisms and blah blah, blah. and then we look at the way they compete with others more or less similar to them, but that want to be in the same environment. You know, you know, carve out their own little niches. The the identity thing is fascinating in this context, though, because it's like, uh, like, how do we keep track of that so that it is to us? How do we maintain something's identity? You know, how do we maintain? How does a thing maintain a system maintain its own sense of identity? <clears throat> if if there's conflict doesn't the conflict change the system and thus you know its identity to an extent maybe what it wants to do is not just go away completely right that's different that's like you know death or whatever that's that's not the same thing though just because i was thinking about something uh and of course i'm not Oh, the steady state thing. Like, it's like, uh, you know, we look at plants, you know, and you've all seen those people set a camera on a plant and then they fast forward through the day and you see the plant's got this very, you know, uh, exciting mm -hmm. life in fast, you know, fast forward. But to us, whatever. And then, you know, so you go out, you see the plant and you're like, whatever, I don't give a shit. You don't do anything. You're basically a rock. But then the next day it's got flowers and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> and then like yet yeah, to the, to the plant, it's like, but to you, it's like suddenly it's either its identity has changed. It's gone from the ugly duckling to the beautiful swan or, you know what I mean? Like that somehow how we interact with it, uh, even though are we to say that it's the same plant, it maintains its identity, and yet our behavior around it, if it's got flowers or not, changes perhaps, you know? Whether or not we approach it, we change, like, if it's just, we're just talking about humans, maybe we feel better in the presence of something pretty to us or whatever. Yeah, or the, the way that other species could interact with it like a deer comes along and nips it off and like oh delicious and then we would call that a conflict relationship yeah. or the insect comes along and wants to pollinate it and then we call that a cooperative yeah. relationship because it looks as to us as though right. both benefit in some way and blah, blah, blah. interesting i like this already yeah me too well already jesus <laughs> All right. Anyway, continue. I mean, so the, the next, next set of concepts or whatever that I want to talk about are, and this is one of the chapter titles, from tropism to behavior. So a tropism defined by Rappaport is a tendency to move along a gradient. And a gradient is 
an asymmetric condition on two sides of a system. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what he's putting forward as the first step toward getting interesting. If you have tropistic, but well, I don't want to call it behaviors because he's contrasting it with the word behavior. But if you, if you move around in a patterned manner, when immersed in gradients that have less on one side and more on the other, and you head towards the more or towards the less, that would be a tropistic. And that's kind of like the plants mm -hmm. or whatever. Well, they go toward the sun. You've got your house plant, and you have yeah. to turn it every once in a while, or it just like kind of pushes against the window, and it's mm -hmm. asymmetrical and less beautiful to us. So I think, right, a plant growing toward the light is a tropism. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Natural selection ensures that tropism selected for are of survival value to the organism. Tropisms act mechanically. They involve some physical gradient in the environment. So that's layer one or whatever. But what about behavior? Behavior distinguished from tropism involves an act of all or none recognition. Such all or none differentiation depends on the presence or absence of some crucial distinguishing feature of the stimulus. And parenthetically, I would add, you know, to the system. And now we get into the, you know, the idea of abstracting or whatever, that there's a, that the system perceives, it intakes across its boundary some stimulus, it maybe does some act of categorization, and then perhaps learns a way to respond to signals that it classifies as of a type. Oh, I know how to deal with that. I eat it, or I fuck it, or I run from it, whatever. <laughs> so right. with tropism, you have triggering. To trigger a process means to initiate it with the expectation that once initiated, the process proceeds of its own accord on a dynamics that has been prearranged. Dot, 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 quote, unquote, you know, by evolution. So tropisms get triggered and behaviors get learned and slash conditioned. Well, every time the bell rings, the food comes and, and I salivate or whatever, you know. I guess that maybe is a kind of uh -huh. an edge case between a tropism and a behavior, like the Pavlovian response. And then we can go all the way up to Mr. A, whose alarm clock goes off. And he has learned that that means, oh, it's time to go to work. I got to shave and shower and get on the train. You know, that's a, a learned set of behaviors that are, you know, it, it, we would use the word triggered or whatever, but initiated by the, the stimulus or the signal or the symbol of the alarm clock going off. Now, I, I'm having thoughts. Yeah, I'm having thoughts, but let's just. Is this possibly the difference then between development and evolution? That tropism and triggering is evolution. It's based, you know, it's the evolutionary <clears throat> change. And that behavior and learning is more the developmental. Mm, I mean, I, I would probably tend towards saying that I could see evolutionary aspects to both. Especially if you want to believe in memes, right? Yeah. But it, I understand, I think, the sense in which you're thinking about it. And yes, that's a way that many might tend to think about it. That you, Because, uh, you know, behavior and learning aren't, quote-unquote, in the genes or in the DNA. But uh, reflexive or tropistic responses are closer to the, to the genes. But some yeah. of us want to extend evolutionary thinking to the behavior and learning layer also. And then we need to come up with... That's part of the motivation to have memes, another replicator, a non... -gen yeah. Well, how do you know that behavior isn't just a, just a triggered thing? You know what I mean? Like, But it's triggered for different reasons. But that triggering gets entrained in a completely different environmental context. And then... Then, when it encounters that new environmental context, which the learning or conditioning has to do with the frequency of w upon which it is uh, encountering that new environmental context, 
eventually it gets in you know more locked in because uh you could say something like maybe natural selection just keeps favoring those that that have that trigger in a particular way uh that leads to their success and reproduction and all that you know uh, survival and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> and that there's really just this you know whatever you want to call it you could call it the genes and you could call it the environment but that gene environment interaction is that you know given a different kind of environment you know the same set of genes does something a little different because it's just channeled and funneled in different ways in this other environment and provided it was a successful provided it was it it's like you know you chose correctly you know or whatever then that can hopefully continue within the the lifespan of the system, what, however we're going to define it. So if it's an individual or something like that, it's like how does the how do the elephants you know know to go to the water hole in particular and you know all that kind of stuff and how does that just get passed on through the generations and but all of a sudden what if you know climate change happens and that water hole isn't going to do it anymore and so then maybe just the that there are those that have this, you know, background, this sort of, let's just say genetic background, let's just pretend. And that also, there's some variation there and some go left instead of right and and they happen to go and hit upon the water hole, you know, a, a new water hole area or whatever. Normally, in the pre- prior circumstance, it would have been death. They would have, you know, uh, died of thirst or whatever. But now it's like, oh, we can go left now or whatever. And all I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> the interplay between these things, and that's where I was thinking, well, just say there's tropism and triggering, and it's just like bing, bong, bing, bong, just going all the time. But then an individual with the with a particular tropism and trigger that it has, maybe normally it would it would be a failure, and then that individual would go away, and and because selection would be like, be gone with you, you know. But in this case, it doesn't, you know, and it's like, oh shit, you know, this is okay, and maybe it, you know, the behavior is essentially the tropism and triggering in that environment where it's like bing bong, and it keeps hitting on that particular uh, context in a way, and it keeps returning to it, or every time it keeps encountering it which maybe the environment has changed or something, then it starts to incorporate or it survives and it continues on. Its offspring have that trait or whatever. And I don't know. I'm just talking. It's if I'm understanding what you're saying, how does that theory, if you're saying that's all, it's all tropisms. Um, what about <laughs> the poker table? Like how could there be individual systems, which, seem to purposefully not get triggered or not respond automatically to certain triggers. Oh, I got a really good hand. I'm going to get all excited. No, oh, 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 don't get triggered by these pocket aces. I have to maintain <laughs> my stoicism in order to bluff and what, you know. So I don't think... Well, I mean, that would be like the whole, like, well, some fight and some flight, you know, like, and, uh, you know... You know what I mean? Like I've, I, I get, uh, I think I've inherited anxiety from my dad and, and him from his, because even though like you could all be sitting at a, t- at a table and some people just in this context, nothing happens. They are just like, oh yeah, I'm just, here I am sitting here with my cards. I know I've got a good hand. I'm not going to get too excited. You know, uh, whatever. But then me next to him was like, holy God, holy God, oh my God. And everyone's like, Get the guy on the left, <laughs> like he's, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, I mean, that's, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm just, I'm just. Well, I really like that back point. and forth. And that gets to another lesson that I have really, I think I've pretty much adopted and wish more people would have that it's. That all of this, and I guess this is the Nietzsche in me or something, that it's all relative to the characterization or the description. Because I think that Mm. debate, I don't know that it has a resolution. If I want to say 
No, the yeah. poker player, you can't do it with just tropisms and triggers because, look, they should be triggered to show excitement when they get a good hand. But then you're like, well, yeah, what if I just re-describe it? So that now more is output into the out into the environment and less in the system. Well, now that that's part of the environment. They know they're at a poker table and their well, trigger you... is not to be triggered by that, you know. And I think that, w yeah. Well, here's the thing. Well, it'd be like if my response was actually a good response to finding a bush with lots of berries and I'm all like, Whoa! And everyone's like, oh, shit, what's going on over there? And then they all come over and they're like, oh, great, look at those berries. But then in the poker table context, I'm like, oh, oh, berries, berries. And then there are just some that don't. You know, they just they just happen upon a bush of berries and they just eat them or whatever. And that's it, you know. And maybe it has a benefit and maybe it doesn't. But in a different context, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know. This is the this is the what we're calling behavior. I'm I'm just trying to like finish off that thought, and not to continue on. Like I get what you mm -hmm. were saying prior. I just wanted to you know. Anyway, you know, just like different conditions, there's variation um, in the triggering or whatever. I, I I don't mean to drag us off into this particular spot. I just I guess I'm uh, stimulated by the. By Rappaport. I'm stimulated. Next topic. Stimuli. Well, yeah, right. So I'll close this out with this little... He has four levels or whatever in which he describes this. One, on the most primitive level, the mechanisms are combined to the permanent structures of an organism. They establish and ensure gradients within maintaining a steady state. Boom. Level two. The next level is organisms with tropisms, usually possess some mechanism of locomotion that enables them to move into more favorable locations. Three, animals with sufficiently developed nervous systems can recognize patterns of events in an all or none fashion to which they respond with patterns of behavior. And then four, animals capable of behavior that results in more or less permanent changes to the environment making it more favorable for survival <clears throat> niche construction examples nest weaving web yeah, spinning no. dam building blah 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 so that's his kind of four so part only, level of yeah. tropism to behavior yep yeah I, I he's he's scooping a lot right now i i should uh you should you should i should read yeah this i book. thought you'd like it <laughs> It's scooping a lot. Oh, you mean so, this? Yeah, sure. You're saying you've read something in a on a written at a later date that says the same thing? Well, I mean, I, I would be. I don't know. Maybe Lewinton did read Rappaport and you know didn't realize what he was learning and then kind of regurgitated it separately or something. I don't know. But the the it, niche construction doesn't come. I mean, it's not even called niche construction in the earliest forms of it through Lewinton's work, but that's like early eighties. So this is, you know what I'm saying? So this is before that. Even. Well, he didn't use the phrase niche construction. That was me adding it in, but yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. But right. But you're basically, yeah, like I mean, that's kind of the same thing. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like Peter Matthew didn't say natural selection, but it's a pretty, you know, <laughs> in that, you know, appendix of his book on arbor or culture or whatever in 1831 or something that's he basically more or less describes that you know now what we would call natural selection today what darwin so maybe. next chapter is from signal to symbol and i'm i was also thinking this would strike you because i talk about language and symbol symbols a lot and sometimes you're like what the fuck what is that or why do you care so much or whatever <laughs> He's yeah. back in two. Okay, so more rap report. <laughs> Events that evoke conditioned responses become, for that organism, signals, and thereby acquire, quote-unquote, meaning. Meaning of this sort is not to be confused with meaning in the ordinary that we associate with language. But, and this is something, you know, this is another one of those duh things, but that I think people don't say enough. Quote, no two events are ever exactly the same, unquote. Like, yes, <laughs> but you, so many people don't seem to appreciate that enough. Well, I mean, because we're so busy, you know, binning things and categorizing and, and getting excited yes. about that. We identify as the quote-unquote same when we ignore differences that do not interest us. 
That's the all or none thing that I think he was talking about in the previous chapter. So everything is entirely unique, but we don't act that way. We bin, we identify, we abstract. And we abstract by ignoring differences because we consider them irrelevant or don't even know, perceive them in the first place. In the, mm -hmm. uh, the uneducated, in the man on the street who hasn't been trained in general semantics. They don't even notice the difference. Ever. <laughs> so, let's see. Yep. Well, I was going to say that's, that's more niche construction, you know. Anyway, I find that dependent. Oh. <laughs> I mean, because it, yeah, go ahead. No dependence no. of stimulus on its physical features evoking a response characterizes it as a signal Disti and distinguishes it from a symbol. So signals depend on their physical features. Symbols do not. It, that's one difference. The behavior okay. of human beings depends primarily on the recognition of symbols and their generalized meanings. Language is what makes culture possible, and culture is what distinguishes man from every other form of life. Royce Rappaport, and I tend to agree. So that might be a place where you can fight with him. Or I don't know if you I buy that or not. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I am, f I am aware that there are people who would take what we would define as culture and apply it to other, you know, like to chimps and stuff like that and say, eh, it looks like there's some type of, you know, culture there, you know? Um, so I, I think there are some people out there who would argue that, that we, culture is not specific to us. Um, sure. Rep, yeah. and this is, and I don't. I mean, I have never... Rappaport yeah. becomes very Korzybskian about that and defines culture this way. This accumulation of experience and knowledge over generations constitutes an environment with which only human beings can interact. This is what is called culture. So that's time-binding, the accumulation of knowledge over generations. So that's very Korzybskian, and a person doesn't have to buy that, but he's just stipulating that as his definition. Of culture. Ah, well, there you go. And so in his sense, sure. the chimps wouldn't have that. And then we'd have to argue about the semantics of what we're going to mean by culture. Do some normative linguistics. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Out. We don't no, need no. you. Go count some ants, <laughs> you fucking scientist. Go dig up a bone and brush it with a paintbrush. Need one, two, three ants. Four bones, three paintbrushes. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really, I don't have a particular dog in the fight. I just know that that, that was all I wanted to right. say was that some people, based on whatever definitions they've used, suggest that other things can be invited in based on the one that you just gave by Rappaport, which is more... Uh, closely aligned with Korzybski's time binding? Probably not, because um, it's. The, I think without question, the accumulativeness is huge with respect to man-made environment or human-made or anthropogenic environments. Yeah. Whatever. I think that's that's that's. Uh, You know, I would say that's a signal. That's a that's an outward like that's a thing where you're like, oh, I'm in I'm in something that's you know at least on Earth 2019. I'm in a you know, if I can figure out how something's cumulative, if I'm a as fucking Chomsky and people like that like to say, if I'm from Mars, it's like such a 20th century thing to say. But anyway. Um, if I'm a Martian and I come down to Earth and I'm looking for, you know, whatever, I could identify cumulativeness in symbolic as well as other systems. Um, I would say, well, that probably is human, right? Um, and I think that that's a 
that's that's definitely i just don't i don't know of any other organisms that really do the same kind of cumulative thing with the systems that they in you know create or whatever whether that's ants or beavers or chimpanzees or what you know what i mean like it's well, yeah, they've got um, this dam yeah. and this pond, and I can swim around in it, but they don't have a museum with pictures of the greatest dams ever made, and we need to go visit it. And... <laughs> oh, man, look at this one that Grandpa made. Only... He made the greatest dam I've ever seen. They don't oh do that. God. Yeah. That's so great. Well, no, but I mean, we do that with our dams. We're like, my grandfather made Hoover Dam. Anyway, what do you yes. think about this? They don't do that yet. The human being reacts to the world around him through the screen of a language. The human being first tells himself what he experiences, then decides how to react to it. Language mediates practically all of our reactions. Man lives in two environments, a physical one and a symbolic one. I'm trying to think of like, I mean, he... He hedged well enough that I'm not going to say, you know, he didn't say all. He mm -hmm. said practically all. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm not like, I can't just be like, gotcha. Uh, again, I think I'm going to recall the, if it's 1980 and I'm living where I'm living and you're living where you're living, I think it's more ap applicable to me than it is to you. Because, again, you can take 50 paces outside your door and be in muck, you know. And not only could I, I do quite often. <laughs> That's classic. Classic! Um, but also, I don't have... I, I want to, like, nowadays, like, I feel like, you know, you, you make a statement and you can probably find... Especially if you make a, if you look at a statement made in 1974 or whatever, there's probably some research that's been done that has something to say about, you know, whatever the outcome or results were from that, about that kind of a thing, you know? And so I kind of think, oh, there's probably research out there that has a, has an answer to that statement or whatever. If they formulated it into a question, they'd have an answer. Um, and that it could go probably both pro and con. Anyway. Hmm. I don't know what the con would even... I don't know how you could deny that. That man lives in two environments, deny. a physical and a symbolic and whatever. No, I wouldn't say that it's not... I thought I oh, was the, responding the primarily. to... Yeah, I guess that's the, the idea that you know you tell yourself. Oh, sure. Okay, you that do part, anything. Yeah, you know that kind of. Yeah, there could be some, uh, you know, brain scan experiments or whatever. You know, hook them up and run them through these paces and see what you see. Yeah. Are there good reasons to suspect that we language it first? That there is language processing between signal and behavior, or how much of the time is there and not? Yeah, and so that was the thing I was thinking that there might be some some probably neuroscientific work that's been done on those on those ideas or statements. Hypothesis. Well, anybody who knows of some, <clears throat> refer us to yeah. it, because I'm interested. Maybe we'll look it up and talk about it in the future. But yeah, if there were some empirical researches into that, I'd be curious to see, read about them. Yeah, because I tend to on the side, I tend to side more on, and whether it's justified or not, but I just my my general reaction is to, is almost always to be like, we think we're special, we're probably not, you know, like okay, yes, we've drawn, we've delineated ourselves from this or whatever, and we've done as good a job as we can, but how is that really like relative to the four point five billion years? that earth has been around or whatever, how is that really important or different in any kind of significant way? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm always just like, yeah, but what if, you know, <clears throat> we really aren't doing what we think we're doing and, and we really aren't special in any kind of way, 
you know, in especially that kind of way. Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, we're moving up the great chain of being here. To use that metaphor, right. you know, we yeah. start with the rocks and go to the plants and the amoebas and the antelopes, and then we reach man. And then man himself yeah. starts doing this symbolic cultural evolution, perhaps, some of us think, that's underlied by all of these linguistically mediated activities, like abstracting, identifying, categorizing, uh, and, you know, is all of it metaphor like Nietzsche and Hofstetter think and whatever, and, uh, and we get this language and we use language to build cultures, and then does culture itself start to evolve? Well, I don't know. That depends on if there's memes. So let me Blah. read some of this stuff where I'm saying that this is the Dawkins scooping. <laughs> Nice, please. Man-made environment is our main area of interest, and culture is another name for it. Just what units of a culture are reproduced? How are they reproduced? Does the reproduction involve variations analogous to phenotypes, and does natural selection act on these variations? If it does, we ought to be able to define the fitness of a variant. We shall take an example of the evolution of language, and then he goes into that. But, you know, right there, you've already got the basics, right? Culture, there are units of culture, they get reproduced. Through what mechanism do we, if we can get units and variations, we can talk about natural selection in culture. And then he talks about, you know, Dennett's favorite idea or exemplar of a meme is he said, well, do you believe words exist? Well, words are memes that can be pronounced, says Dennett. But a bunch of years ago, Rappaport was writing, We can, therefore, consider each utterance as an individual in a population called language. This individual exists for only a moment, but it has progeny. The fact that the word was uttered contributes to the likelihood that it will be uttered by again, by the same speaker or others. As long as the repetitions continue, the word lives. In the language. Shifts in the direction of changes in speech habits will be selected for, that is, imitated by other speakers. Culture is the totality of man-made objects, rules, expectations, patterns of behavior, attitudes, and beliefs that constitute man-made environment. Culture exists only as long as the items that comprise it are reproduced. Culture evolves by virtue of the variations in its items and by virtue of the fact that a process analogous to natural selection acts on these variations. And this sounds like Dawkins could have written this sentence, right? The items may be material, dress, houses, weapons, or behavioral, speech patterns, <laughs> customs, rituals, or mental attitudes, beliefs, aspirations. All of them are reproduced. Material items are being copied. Behavioral items are reproduced by being imitated. And that's the Blackmore thing about imitation. But you see what I mean? How this entire chapter sounds exactly like memes. He just didn't give the units a nice, catchy word. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, if I can do it quick enough, I have the self esteem right here. Oh, yeah. I'll read the, the one more thing so while I could, you're looking I could... that up. If you're looking that up to contrast the the way Dawkins writes it. Um, yeah, yeah. So right. yeah, he all near the end of the chapter he writes changes are incorporated into a culture not necessarily because they enhance the survival value. They may simply be the result of positive feedback. Cultural change produces its own man-made environment, and adaptations are made to it. There is no guarantee that these adaptations enhance the survival potential of the culture, and then I would add, or of the biological individuals who are doing the imitating. So it, this is what I take to be the separation of, you know, the second replicator, the new... the the meme, the new thing. It's not, it's reproducing in virtue of its own selective environment. 
It's not based on what's good for culture. It's not based on what's good for the person saying it. It's good for the word or whatever. You know, the the unit. Yep. I have two things. First, quote, examples of means are tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, fashions, ways of making pots, or of building arches. Yep. That's what I was remembering when, yeah. (laughs) You're just like, oh, yeah, that's, maybe he did read uh Rappaport. who knows um but what the the one thing that i'm not hearing from Rappaport that you definitely catch uh of course you would from dawkins is that memes was a direct attempt to try and like if there is a unit then he wants an analogous unit to a gene some kind of analogous cultural unit to the material material hereditary unit mm-hmm. of the gene so that was that was uh that's the i that's the primary difference i think i'm not hearing rapaport being like like genes we have you know um well i i, I mean i think so did i um when he's saying culture evolves by virtue of variations in its items and that a process analogous to natural selection acts on these variations material items are reproduced by being copied and behavioral items are reproduced by being imitated. I don't know. Maybe not. No, I mean, if anything, he's like going around, like talking around without saying. Oh, gene? yeah, I, I don't, don't see hear him say that I mean. exactly. No. Which I mean, of course, Dawkins. It's all like I wonder how many times the word gene floats yeah. into his brain. That is a meme that has taken over mm-hmm. Dawkins' brain. The word gene. <laughs> anyway. The meme um, gene, which itself, my I mean, only thinking, genes are memes, you know. <laughs> the, well, is there a meme gene? That's the other thing. Anyway, uh, um, there's a gene meme, there, yeah. but is there a meme um, gene? That's what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> so, when I was listening to you talk about Rappaport, I guess my question is this: when, um. You know, uh, uh, groundhogs or meerkats or monkeys or whatever. Whenever some kind of organism, you know, it's in a social group, um, you know, is using these different calls. I've I've mentioned this in the past in past episodes. When they're using different calls for like snake and mm-hmm. leopard or whatever. I mean, what. I don't know if those change over time. I wouldn't doubt that they do. And I imagine maybe even they, they're different across, you know, groupings of these, you know, little uh, um, communities or whatever of, of little mammals or whatever. Um, would you say those are memes? I want to say, I think, that I want maybe to carve out another little in-between spot there. Because there's something shared and different and special about if... If I were convinced that really there were this species of monkey that had three different calls that meant snake, eagle, and leopard, or whatever, right? That's what they say. That's pretty good and pretty close to being a full-on symbol. But there's still something missing, maybe. Then I need to go... And they do those in the presence of those predators. There's an eagle up there, they make the noise, and they respond appropriately. But then there's another step sitting around the campfire at night and saying, remember that eagle earlier? That was fucked. That was scary. That's what I think they still don't do. (laughs) To be able to token that noise without it being stimulated by the actual presence. You know what I mean? Well, what about this? Um, Now, I wish I could imitate David Attenborough's voice, but like, there is a kind of bird, and I think it's in Africa, and it has, of course, you know how birds can you know, say things and imitate almost, you know, super, the fidelity of their imitations are incredibly high. So they can, they can sound like your uncle or they can sound like the dog barking or whatever. So they use that against the group to be able to go and get whatever it is, berries on the bush that, you know, uh, the meerkats have collected and they go in and, and grab the berries while the meerkats have scattered because they've made the eagle ah, nice. sound, you know? What about that kind of a situation? Because there, the meerkats still respond, but there is no eagle. 
also when you make the the sound presumably you don't know if there is one you just hear it and you respond by running for cover you don't necessarily stop and be like right. where That's how you know it's kind like of tropistic one right? sees it the noise is tokened in your yeah. presence and you just go you run into the hole or away from the hole or you, you know you do the right thing so yeah that bird case i th- would tend to categorize in the same place as the monkey call and still not like a human arbitrary symbolic language because you know you could describe the situation as well right. to that bird that noise means get the fuck out of here and give me those berries or what like it's it's a noise that it can token in the actual situation when it wants to cause the food competitor to leave the area so it can have them but don't you think that there's okay. still something now different I... between tokening it in when you're using it? Or, you know, we could use the use mention distinction and say the bird is using that noise to get berries. But only we are able to mm-hmm. mention that word when we're around the campfire later. We're not actually scaring anybody away from any berries. We're just talking about, oh man, when I used the noise earlier... It was awesome. I had 12 of them scattering. You know, and you're just talking about it without doing it. So the utterance itself, it, it requires... Somehow the idea is that the utterance wants to replicate or reproduce itself through others, um, given maybe it has varying contexts. One is the actual situation where you're like, bear another is this one where you're sitting around a campfire and you're like remember that bear you know and then uh another one is like where you're walking into a an area and you're like i think there are bears here <laughs> you know like um so you could have all these various uh environments or whatever where that particular meme word utterance whatever is being shared among individual uh, let's say humans um but that given this other set of organisms like meerkats or whatever, it's only, I mean, it's, it's, it's just audio. It's just like visual or scent or something like that. Is that essentially the kind of separation you're trying to make that there is, you know, it's just an audio signal, just like there might be a visual signal. If they can see color, I don't know. But maybe, let's just say they can see the red berries or whatever. They're like, okay, that's this. Boom, hits me. I'm like, yep, okay. And it's got the right shape or whatever. They're doing the whole binding problem. <laughs> anyway, and then, uh, you know, it could be whatever, scent or whatever. Oh, she's ready to mate. Or <laughs> I don't know. You know, like, and so then there's the response, the physiological, morphological, whatever, behavioral responses by each individual organism in this little group, troop, whatever. Of meerkats, let's say. (laughs) There's anyone who's like a meerkat (laughs) biologist. They're just like slapping their face right now. Just like, Jesus Christ. Um, Yeah, like I guess... I think I understand what it is you're trying to say. And, um, you know, just trying to be tidy about it. So that it doesn't... So that you can't be like, okay, yes... These are actual memes. Shit, maybe these meerkats have culture. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, how do you partition it off so that, no, it's a different thing? And I think what you're trying to say, to me anyway, is that there are a variety of uh, contexts upon which it can be used. Uh, in the meerkat case, per, per chance, perhaps, whatever, it's almost always the same, like, holy shit! You know? <laughs> right? But if... In the human context or whatever, you could be out and the bear's coming at you and someone yells, bear! But then around the campfire, you know, you don't yell, bear, every time. You just say, bear, and blah, blah, blah. And and you know what I mean? Like, you say it in different ways. Yeah. And that's... Per the context, you know? Rapport was mentioning back at the beginning when he was distinguishing signal and symbol, that signals had physical characteristics involved and symbols don't. We... And that's one of the things that the Martian biologist of Chomsky, etc., might find nice. amazing about us. We can have the same behavioral response to someone screeching, 
bear or someone whispering. You know, maybe we don't want the bear to hear, so we just go to each other. There's a bear. Let's get the fuck out of here. And then everyone starts running. Or you could scream bear and start running. But it works both times. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Or you could, right. you know, write it on a note card, tap them on the shoulder and hold it up. B-E-A-R. And don't make any noise. Right. And so there's, there, you know, I or still even want, just I think that's it. a difference that makes a difference. So that's one of the ones that I want to, that I think is relevant and I want to chop the world up. I want to cat- add that category in, that that seems different. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I, I, I'll, I mean, definitely, I'm... That was the purpose of me trying to get at it. I was trying to say, okay, yeah, it's there's something different about what we're talking about when we talk about memes. Them naked on their own, it gets a little harder to, for me anyway, to just say, oh yeah, I'll go along with it. But when you start talking about the way you just did, I'm like, okay, yeah, there's something a little mm-hmm. bit different here. Cool. Excellent. Well, to kind of wrap things up, I don't. This is the part of the book that I don't think. To wrap, wrap a board of them up. up. Sorry. That I don't want to talk too much about Sorry. this part of the book, but this is just kind of what he was leading up to with all that other stuff and what he was leading up to in the previous weeks of our uh, podcast. Conflict resolution, he gets to talking about. There ought to be a Sweet. more general term designating the cessation of conflict, whether by conciliation, disengagement, or destruction of one, both, or all the participants. And he draws this uh, distinction between endogenous conflicts, which are those where the conflicting systems are parts of a larger system that has its own mechanisms for maintaining steady state, and that would be like going on Judge Judy. Both of Everyone involved Ooh. still exists within... American democracy and whatever, but yet they're still in conflict in small claims court and they're arguing about something. But everyone agrees to abide by what the judge says and we all are, uh, you know, still wearing clothes and not shooting each other and whatever. So that's an endogenous conflict. But if there is no super system that exercises control or mediates conflict resolution, that would be an exogenous conflict. And I think that would be more like international relations. There's the, you know, um, international criminal courts and treaties and accords and all this stuff is pretty iffy, I think, on Earth uh, (laughs) B or CE or whatever. It's there's no clear, widely accepted governing body that, that we're all endogenous to. And that can get really messy. So I think, you know, that and Rappaport might not like those very much because that's where war comes in. So we've got endogenous, exogenous, and then we've got symmetric conflict where the participants are roughly similar and perceive themselves as such, the people on Judge Judy, or asymmetric conflict where the systems are widely disparate or may perceive each other in different ways, Cold War or something, right? Then there can be issue-oriented conflicts, which are resolved when an issue is settled, does not evolve, involve a change in the structures of either of the conflicting systems, Judge Judy, or a structure-oriented conflict, which is not resolved until the structure of either system changes, uh, you know, post-World War II Germany, right? So he has at least those three dimensions and perhaps more to try to make a taxonomy or formalization of idealized conceptions of conflict. Um, So, yeah, that's all going on. And I think that's the domain of conversation that Zizek and Peterson are participating in. This larger framework of fights, games, debates, taxonomy of conflict, and how to deal with different types of large-scale exogenous sociopolitical disputes. There's something to be... St- okay. okay, but then what about... What about? What about? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, what what is a revolution then? Is it endogenous asymmetric? Or, like, what is that then? Because we've been talking about that too. Yeah. 
I wonder, like, could we use those three to make one? So, yeah, it would be asymmetric, mm. right? Because the revolutionaries and the status quo government would perceive themselves and each other in different ways. Like, you guys are terrorists. No, we're freedom fighters, whatever. Right. And it's a structure-oriented conflict because the revolu- it's not resolved until we, you know, overthrow the government or something. So asymmetric, structure-oriented, yeah. endogenous. The conflicting systems are part of a larger system or there is no super system. So maybe in that case, they would even view that one differently. Maybe the government sees it as an endogenous conflict. You are citizens under our rule and, you know, we want to exert power over you but the revolutionaries might say nope we don't accept you as a super system that exercises control over us this is an exogenous conflict and we're just doing what is morally right or something and we're our cause is above and outside of you and so they might even like the american revolution right right that would make sense somewhat useful framework to talk about these Um, ideas at least i think and again, yeah, obviously, so. no fact of the matter about that, whether it really is or isn't. It's just a <laughs> useful system of words. Idiot. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm. <laughs> See, that meme is so implanted in your head. You hear the word useful, and your brain's like, useful idiot, that's a phrase. And it's just like, say me. Definitely. But I'm terrible at language because most of the time I'm like, uh, and there's like memes are like, how the fuck do we get out of this guy's head? (laughs) You know, because other people are really quick, quick witted. And I wish I had that meme control. control. (laughs) Maxwell Smart meme control. (laughs) Fighting chaos. With a K. So then the last thing I'll talk Ooh. about is just where he gets into, he talks a little bit about ideologies and how they perhaps too could be looked at as systems of what? Of beliefs. An ideology being a system of belief shares some aspects with these more material systems we've been talking about. For example, it quote, the, all these have scare quotes around them. It strives to maintain a steady state. One of its homeostatic mechanisms is a principle of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive inputs that don't fit into the belief system are either ignored or interpreted in a way that makes them fit. The criterion of dogma is simple. A doctrine is dogma if it is not possible to challenge any of its assertions without being immediately and categorically refuted or dismissed. And Anyway, so that I kind of like that little nugget to throw out at the end too. Or what if we look at an ideology itself as a system that can be in conflict with its semantic or symbolic environment such that it acts to, you know, move itself around in the gradient, or, you know, to maintain itself. And it's like, oh, you're, <laughs> you don't really fit with me, so I need to shun you or change you or blah, blah, blah. I like all that. Yeah, I definitely like that. Jesus yeah, I think like so. That. He talks about ideology often. And I don't know, let's see. Everything yeah. is ideology. Sorry. I don't know exactly how he would look at it. But that might be a question for oh, another either. day. Or to But you know that you would you would trigger his meme plex if you just said ideology. Likely, yes. <laughs> He'd be like, <laughs> He'd be like ah, talk. So yeah, that's I wanted to throw some of that out there and now it is. You have any anything you want to talk about awesome. or place you want to go, or is it time to close? Time All right. to close. I'm Anatol Rappaport. Conflict in man-made environment. Put it on your Amazon want list. <laughs> want list? It's called a wish list. Even oh, I know that meme. Wish list. But it, it, so it sounds like it'll never happen then if it's just a wish. Well, I mean, 
I just saw a tweet where Bezos was making like eighty-seven thousand dollars a minute last year. So yeah, you're never gonna get. Well, it. I wish, wish more people would read it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. On your wish list. Okay, people. Enough.